Okay. Welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. And thanks Tess and Sam for a great talk so far. And uh, I'm going to be talking about unit tests. Um, I, I work at Chef Software, as you see on there. And um, let's see. So unit tests um, is some, one of my passions for many years. Um, I've only been with Chef for about a year, but it's something I've kind of uh, studied um, for, for quite a number of years. And uh, what you'll see here is a hodgepodge of things from my learning, from my reading, from things that my team is doing. Wow, that is a lot of feedback, isn't it? Is that any better? Okay. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, uh, they gave me a really short slot, so I'm going to condense my 60-minute talk, which I actually did write, uh, into 10 minutes here. So, but I've got lots of slides. Okay. So, in a nutshell, I'm going to reduce very quickly. <laughs> Introduction is basically over. Uh, let's get on with it. Okay, uh, just a real quick introduction. Um, what I basically do, uh, I think, I code, I share, generally in that order. Um, but um, this is, if internet is going to work for me here. Okay. Wow, all of a sudden, real slow. It worked a minute ago. Wow. Okay, we'll skip that. I guess I should have hardwired, but okay, so don't really need that. Go away. Okay, back to slides. Uh, Envision, if you will, that was a, a very uh, mass confusion of neurons floating around the brain. Okay, so anyway, that's what I was going to say. Okay, so. Uh, uh, general concepts. I'm actually not going to go through all these because we don't have time. Uh, <laughs> Basically, uh, the gist of this slide is unit tests are important. They're not terribly um, exciting or, or uh, attractive per se, but they are fundamental to everything we do. Um, okay, so let's go on to skip a section here. Okay, uh, first topic I'm going to talk about is code coverage, but with a twist. Uh, most, most folks are familiar with code coverage, what I call uh, the breadth aspect of it. That is, you um, know what your code is doing line by line, how much of it is covered. What I like to focus on is depth coverage, and I'll talk about uh, a little more details of both of these, um, and actually a composite of them. This particular picture I show uh, because when I did a web search, that's what it turned up. I'm still trying to decipher the exact meaning of how that relates here, but I'll leave that to you folks. Um, so. This is breadth uh, coverage. That is, um, in uh, your file, it'll actually highlight what lines are covered, what lines are not covered with your tests when you run them. And I don't know if you know, one of my tips here is you can actually get code coverage right in VS Code with the command that you see there. It shows the lines you've touched, but I claim that's not quite enough. Okay. To get into depth coverage, um, there's a couple topics uh, related to that, the equivalence class partitioning and boundary value analysis. So basically answers the question, how many tests do you need? Consider a function returning a largest int. So say we pass it a five element uh, list in a test. Do we need to test a six element list or a 17 element list or you know, pick your favorite number kind of thing? Okay. Equivalence class partitioning uh, kind of addresses that question. So I'm taking a different example here. Say we want to transform lowercase ASCII characters in a string into uppercase and other characters remain unchanged. Okay. So for implementation, we're going to create a set of equivalence classes and then pick one from each class. Okay. The set I've done is at the bottom here, four different equivalence classes. This is not the the only set, you can come up with different equivalence classes. Um, uh, but this, this is one that, that uh, is uh, kind of a common thing you would, might parse for, lowercase, uppercase, non-alphabetic, and even non-printable. Okay? You see the inputs at the bottom there uh, and what outputs they sh should generate, how many test cases in there, adding up to the requisite 128 you know, for uh, lower ASCII. So if you pick one test case from each equivalence class, that's a total of four tests, instead of exhaustively having to give all the inputs of 128. In this case, of course, you could do 128. It's not that big a number, but in most real life situations, it's impractical to test all inputs exhaustively. Okay. Boundary value analysis is a refinement, <coughs> excuse me, which says that essentially not every member of an equivalence class is, well, equivalent because values at boundaries are noteworthy uh, 
and a typical example might be an off by one error is where you would uh, hit at the boundary type of thing, okay? So here at the bottom, um, I have um, the same four equivalence classes, but now I'm showing a value in the middle, such as, so for the row number one, value in the middle, just W picked arbitrarily, and then values at the boundaries, A and Z. So we get three test cases instead of the original one test case. You add those up, we now have 17 test cases versus, again, exhaustive 128, which is you know, a heck of a lot better than that. And this gives you a very high confidence level that you have gone into depth. You have essentially uh, covered your code in a lot more quality. It's, it's not just a single test that happens to touch a line of code. You know that, by golly, all of your inputs uh, that can conceivably go in there have been covered thoroughly. Okay. That's what you get from boundary, boundary value analysis and equivalence cost partitioning. Okay, so of course we have to show example and go. Um, I had a bunch of slides talking about data-driven tests, but here I'm just going to assume that everybody knows what data-driven tests are, uh, which is basically the, the top sections one and two. You define uh, what a test case looks like. In this case, an input, which is a set of integers, uh, the expected value, which will be an integer. And uh, this is actually going back to the first example, if you're keeping up. So we're taking a list of integers, returning the maximum. Okay. Uh, so the uh, second yellow two up there is the list of our test cases. Okay. So this is uh, essentially the equivalence classes for the set of inputs. Um, and so then uh, section three is actually the test runner for a, a, a data-driven test where you have uh, the t.run, you uh, arrange what you need to do, you do your thing, and then you make assertions about it. Uh, one of the other things I was going to talk about at length was write your tests for humans, not for machines. Uh, machines can pretty much parse however ugly your code is and figure out what you want, but humans, not so much. Uh, you, you want someone to be able to look at particularly test code um, so it's very obvious, very easy uh, to understand what you're doing. So one thing I'm showing here is the arrange act assert pattern. You might wonder because the labels arrange act assert. Uh, and that is you put your setup stuff first, then you do what you want to do, then you assert what you've done. Okay? Um, and in practice, um, I actually wouldn't probably put the comments in, but I would put the blank lines between sections. So essentially, your first paragraph is your arrangement, your second paragraph is your doing stuff, and your third paragraph is your assert. So it's obvious to any reader, a code reviewer, for example, to know what's where in the tests. Okay? Uh, another uh, thing in that regard, in terms of readability, um, up in the, the top section, item two, you have the list of tests. Give them meaningful names. Um, so not just give the, the inputs and outputs, but give a name to the test. So again, it's, it's a lot more clear, what is this equivalence class? Okay? Well, the first one is the monotonic descending sequence that we're testing. Okay? Um, and then at the bottom, you see uh, where it's actually run. So you see those names that we have our test find function with, with each name next to it. So you, you have a very clear idea of what's going on there. Okay, I'm gonna skip over many, many slides. <laughs> yeah, I assume you've all just absorbed all of those. But don't worry, I'll give you a chance to see them all again in slow motion. Okay. Um, so I had, I had uh, a bunch of sections uh, with multi-slides, and now this is a section of kind of single slide per talk, because I think I'm running out of time. Okay. Uh, so just a couple quickies here. Um, assert versus require. I use the uh, testify library, which is a very handy thing. Basically, you, you put in asserts, as you saw on my previous slide, for what you're doing. Here on the left, I have asserts with conditionals uh, on them. On the, on the right-hand side, I change those to just requires. Again, in terms of human readability, you're separating what is essential to this test versus what is not essential. Yes, we need to know that there was a nil here or not nil there, but make them requires because we don't really care about them in this test. So where you just see the asserts in the bottom section, that's what a reader needs to focus on. Okay. Uh, real quick, so test versus subtest. Um, now, not necessarily either of these is, is good or bad. Um, I, I think that subtests provide a little more ease of use and, and better facilities, but uh, in, in uh, our code bases at Chef, actually, I see a lot of both of these. But basically, subtests, I'm kind of listing the advantages here. You can share common setup and tear down, create hierarchical tests, et cetera. Um, just one piece I wanted to touch on that in terms of the setup and tear down. In the classical Go style, I found this neat pattern. 
the yellow piece is where I draw your attention to, uh, where we are putting the calls together. So we're making this setup stuff for our test, actually return the function that will do the teardown, and then just defer the teardown so it guarantees to run even in case of panic. And then up at the top, the setup test case guy puts the definitions together. You have your, your setup and your teardown right there. So I, I think that's kind of handy pattern. Um, file package conventions, this just lets you see um, your, your standard, you put your code under test in a package foo and a file bar dot go. Um, most of your tests should be in a separate package, foo under bar test, because the Go system knows what that means, um, and you put it in the bar under bar dot test dot go. And again, go, go knows what to do with those. It won't include that file in, in your production code. Um, and it lets you test behavior rather than implementation, which is what you really want to focus on in uh, unit tests. And unfortunately, I can't go into more about that particular point, but that is a very important point there. Um, if you do need to get to internals, you can use the internal test uh, convention on there. Um, and I think I'm just about out of time, so let me just get to my end slide here. Um, so you've seen the movie. Uh, it turns out I wrote a lengthy article about this entire thing, so you can see these and everything else I was going to tell you about um, on the URL there. I will post this, uh, the URLs for all these in the, uh, uh, the Go Northwest Slack and, and the Gopher Slack as well. Um, and I guess I will stop there and let everyone take a break. Thank you.